Please be seated and let's pray. Father, it's so good um, to be reminded by that song that um, this is not home and that we are pilgrims and aliens and strangers in this world um, headed for a glorious day when we will see you. And there are many troubles and many trials and there are some really good things also along the way. But Lord, this is not home. And it is good to be in this frame of mind as we come to your word and let it speak over our lives. And Father, that is our desire that we would get to see whatever vista it is that you take us to today and we can look out and into and through your word and see what you want us to see. Lord, in your word, you, you reveal such amazing truths about you, about your son, about your love, about your mercy and your patience and your compassion for sinners like us. And you also, in your word, let us look down into some very dark holes that are terrifying. And Father, that is where you have us today to look. I pray, Lord, you'd give us courage to look. And we're thankful that we don't have to look into these dark places without a reminder or without memory of the gospel, that we have hope in Jesus Christ. Would you buoy us today with him? And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter 7, Romans 7 this morning. We will specifically be in verses 7 to 13, 7 to 13 of Romans 7, but what I want to do is I want to read verses 1 to 13 so that we can just get the bigger context. Here's Romans 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through law. For I, do not, I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. A doctor's patient gets an MRI and the MRI reveals a tumor within. 
the patient could say, I would not have come to know of that tumor except through an MRI. A kid in the late 70s, perhaps early 80s, at the dentist's office, the kid will remain nameless because I don't have his permission to say his name, chewed on a little red tablet of dye which revealed where the tartar already was on his teeth. And the kid could say, I would not have come to know of that tartar except through that tablet. The tumor in the patient was already there. The tartar was already there on the kid's teeth. The MRI only revealed it. The dye in the tablet only revealed it. And both of those are good. Those are good revelations. No patient goes home vilifying the MRI machine or the tech because of what it revealed. And no kid goes home vilifying dye tablets, except every kid did who did that, I know. And that's exactly the point. Because there's a concern now in Paul in chapter 7, because he has made some shocking statements about law, about the law, that could easily be misunderstood. Most recently, look back in verse 5. He says, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. I mean, if anything, you remember in chapter 6, the, the, the protest was uh, grace and sin are like in partnership together. They're in cahoots with one another. Listen, if anybody's in cahoots with sin, it's the law, you might conclude. And Paul has just said the, that the believing Jew that he's addressing here has died to the law. Do you remember that's Paul's pastoral concern here in verse 1? I am speaking to you, brethren, the ones who know law. Well, who would that be? That would be the Jews who had become believers in Jesus Christ now. The believing Jew who once lived under the law as a power for achieving self-righteousness has now died to that very law. Verse 4. The believing Jew's relationship to the law's ruling authority and power has been fundamentally changed. They have been freed or released from it. And what did Paul say back in Romans chapter 6? He said that the believer, now get this, the believer has died to sin, meaning that the believer's relationship under the rule of sin has changed. He's no longer a slave to sin. Sin is no longer his master because the believer died to sin. Well, now, if the believer died to sin, such that the believer is no longer a slave to it, and if the believing Jew has died to law, such that he is freed from it, doesn't that put law and sin kind of in the same classification? I mean, the law even stirred up sinful passions in the unbelieving Jew prior to salvation. The law seems almost equal with sin. And this is Paul's great concern in verses 7 to 13. The law was being vilified by some. But Paul is quick to have the believing Jews see its virtue. Now, in this chapter, the word sin occurs many times. And most of the time, um, it has a little article in front of it, the definite article in front of it in the original. So it would be the sin. Meaning what Paul is doing is he is personifying sin. He's talking about sin like it's a, a being of power, with power. Sin is going to do some things here that are, are, are powerful. So he's not just talking about a sin. He will do that also in this passage. But he's talking about the sin power also. Sin as a power in the unbeliever, it accomplishes some very disturbing things through the law. But that is no reason to vilify the law. It remains virtuous. Let me show you the, the law's virtue in this passage. Look at verse 7. Is the law sin? Is it of the quality of sin? Paul says, may it never be. That means banish the thought. That is a holy and horrified rejection of what is false. Paul is saying to us, you should never conclude such a thing. It's preposterous. God forbid that you would ever think anything like that about the law. 
He says, on the contrary, I would not have come to know the sin power except through law. Now look over at verse 12, which is see how virtuous the law is. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. It's holy. It comes from a holy God, and it points to holiness. And so if it's pointing to holiness and sin is nearby, well, of course, sin is going to stand out as sin. And it is righteous. That means it's in harmony with God who is righteous and who is just. It is the right standard of what is just, and it is what the judge approves of. And it's good. The law only ever has the welfare and not the hurt of the one it is given to in mind. It intends to benefit the one it is given to. It is intended to be a benefit to the one it is given to by God. And then look back up at verse 10. There's just this little statement there. This commandment, which was to result in life. Literally, this commandment, which was unto life, that that it's toward life. Its aim was indeed life, God's commands, God's very eternal life. Never was Mosaic law ever given so as to be associated with sin, to be like sin, Because it is holy, it is good, and it is righteous. And never was the law to be associated with death. But it was only given with God's life in mind. A God, a lawgiver of life, making laws that are about death for the one it's given to? That is not the original design intent that God gave regarding the law. But obviously, something really wrong happened. Because Paul makes it clear in this passage that everywhere law was in him when he was an unbeliever, the sin power and sins were everywhere. And death too. And so Romans 7, 7 to 13 helps sort this all out. And that is what this passage is all about. I'll give it to you in two simple statements together today. The law and sin were a deadly mix for unbelieving Paul. But the law was still virtuous. The law is involved in something really horrible that's going on inside an unbeliever, but the law is still virtuous. Those two things are what Paul is after in this passage. And I'm going to keep the focus narrowly in on Paul because this is autobiographical. Paul is referring to himself. And particularly, we'll focus in on what Paul says about himself when he was an unbeliever. There's no mention in verses 7 to 13, there's no mention here of any Romans 6 grace realities like union with Christ. There's no mention here of grace as a power reigning over Paul during this time. There's no mention of even the the newness of life that the Spirit brings that he talked about in verse 6. And that is because Paul is taking us back into himself. Uh, it's, It's like an autopsy of a dead man. And he's doing this because Paul is pastorally burdened in this chapter to help the believing Jews who once would have been under the power of law for their own self-righteousness. He wants to help them see that they have been released from what they were born under, what they were trained up in, and then what they foolishly put themselves under to try to achieve their own self-righteousness before God. These believing Jews um, who know law and they know how it reigns over a life as long as you are alive, they get to see clearly now, listen, they get to see clearly what a life was like when that life was not released from the law yet. And so Paul appeals to his own experience as an unbeliever and we begin to see the horrible inward struggle that he had the more and more formally and intimately he became acquainted with law. It just gets worse and worse and worse. So two important things are happening in this passage. First, Paul's defending the virtue of the law. 
And secondly, Paul is revealing the devastation that the power of sin achieves in the unbeliever through the law. And even though something devastating is happening, when the law and the power of sin come together, the law is still virtuous. You cannot think poorly of the law. So let me give you six facts surrounding all of this. The first and the last one are about the law's virtue, and the other ones in the middle are about the devastating effects of law and sin together in the unbeliever. Verse 7, the last half of verse 7, Paul says, I would not have come... I should give you the point first, even though you can see it. huh? Let's read it. Uh, Unbelieving Paul came to know sin through the law. That's the first fact. Unbelieving Paul came to know sin through the law. Verse 7, I would not have come to know the sin power. That's what he's referring to there. I would not have known this formidable power of sin except through law. Well, well, Paul, what do you mean? Explain. And so he does. Verse 7, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. So proof the law is not nefarious like sin is that it actually pointed out sin. And the 10th commandment is his proof. Um, to covet. That is an inward, strong, sinful, lustful passion. And notice Paul, if you, I don't know how familiar you are with the 10th commandment in Exodus 20 or in Deuteronomy 5, but Paul didn't quote the objects of coveting that are in the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's male or female servant. You cannot um, covet your neighbor's ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The object that the inward lustful passion is directed towards is not Paul's focal point. He's not going to make a list of the things that we're not supposed to covet. His focus is on just the coveting itself inwardly, the lust itself. Even without an object yet to run to, it is known to be sin by unbelieving Paul. It doesn't matter what the object is, was. The law made inward, lustful passion knowable and known as the sin power within Paul. And by this, Paul does not mean that coveting did not exist in him as an unbeliever until the law came. As an unbeliever, like all unbelievers, lustful passions were present inwardly in Paul. But he's saying some kind of a knowledge phenomenon did occur through the commandment that said, you shall not covet. All of a sudden, now, the sin power within him was knowable in a way that it wasn't before that command came. Without the law, without the 10th commandment, unbelieving Paul had difficulty knowing what the sin power was in him. There was this sin power in him he was unaware of. But through the commandment, he knows it. He knows the power of sin in ways he never did before. So the law is virtuous because of this exposing work it does through commands. And these believing Jews who knew law and they knew how it works, they needed this. It's great that the law uh, can do this, that it can reveal sin. But can the law do more than that? Could the law then, after revealing it, remove it or restrain it? That leads to the second fact. Number two, sin commandeered the law to multiply sin in unbelieving Paul. That's what happened. Sin commandeered the law to multiply sin in unbelieving Paul. Look at verse 8. But the sin power, taking opportunity through the commandment. Taking opportunity there uh, is a military word. It means a military operation uh, was being undertaken. The sin power within unbelieving Paul, it took up a base of military operation 
through the commandment mentioned, you shall not covet. The power of sin, again, we're personifying sin like it's a, a being with power that can do things. The power of sin commandeered the commandment. Uh-oh, what did it do with it? Look, it produced in me, Paul says, coveting of every kind. So, get this, the law, upon revealing the sin power, there it is, there's the sin power. The law itself didn't get militant against the sin. Sin became militant with the law against Paul. And isn't this what... Think, what is an unbeliever who thinks, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm going to gain life with God through commandments. That's what I'm going to do. What is he hoping the commandment's going to do? Be militant against his sin. It will beat it back. It will remove it. It will expunge it from me. It. It'll be gone. But we discover a horror of horrors through unbelieving Paul. Oh, there is militant action indeed going on inside him, but it's the power of sin upon being exposed, commandeering the commandment in unbelieving Paul, and then producing militarily in unbelieving Paul coveting of every kind. The image that came to my mind yesterday as I was working on this was um, when the egg sac of, of a spider hatches, and all of those little spiders come out. And so I, I thought I would look for an image, and I watched something that gave me nightmares. <laughs> There's this big wolf spider sitting on top of an egg sac. I know, isn't it great? <laughs> and the next thing you know, I mean, there are just hundreds, if not thousands, of these little baby spiders all over the top of her. That's what's going on. Like a bunch of baby spiders breaking forth from its mother's egg sac, here is coveting of every kind spreading throughout unbelieving Paul. Listen, the law is not sin. It does not have a quality of sin, but the law is hijacked by the sin power within unbelieving Paul, and it hijacks it only so as to produce every imaginable kind of coveting through the law in Paul. And these, these believing Jews now, they need to see this vividly as it was in unbelieving Paul. Surely maybe they can even think back into their own lives and say, I remember something like that too. As good as Mosaic law was, is if this is what happens though in the unbeliever, then the unbeliever must be released must be freed, not only from the law, but from sin as a power, which was Romans 6. But he must also be freed from the law because of what sin as a power does with law. That's Romans 7. Listen, if the unbeliever is going to be saved, he cannot be turned more to the law because sin will only take up more military operations through more commandments if they come. That leads us to the third and the fourth facts. I'm going to give them both to you at the same time because they kind of are two sides of the same coin. Third fact, sin and unbelieving Paul both seemed less perilous without the law. They both seemed less perilous without the law. And then Maybe the opposite. Sin and unbelieving Paul were both more perilous with the law. So what makes all of the difference here? Whether or not the law is present or not. Okay? So let's take the first one. Sin and unbelieving Paul seemed less perilous without the law. You say, what, what do you mean? Verse 8. Let's see how it ends. Uh, for apart from law, and now here, there is no definite article on the sin. So it's for apart from law... A sin is dead. Say, so what do you mean by this? 
Apart from law, a sin is dead. Comparatively speaking, it is dead. A, a sin, like coveting, was always present within before the commandment came, but it seemed and it was less operative without the commandment to unbelieving Paul, in unbelieving Paul. Comparatively speaking, think about it. Coveting prior to the commandment seemed lifeless. Compared to coveting of every kind coming out all over Paul. That's what Paul is saying. A sin like coveting seemed practically lifeless before the sin power commandeered the commandment and produced the lively coveting of every kind in unbelieving Paul. So a sin like coveting seemed less perilous without the law. And Paul says something similar about himself in verse 9. I was once alive apart from law. So, sin, get this, sin seemed dead while I seemed what? Alive. As long as what? There's no law present. Paul states the comparativeness and similarly here. Comparatively speaking, as an unbeliever, when I was apart from law or more distant from the law, I seemed to be alive, more lively. It's as if Paul could say, before that whole you shall not covet command really made its point to me, I didn't perceive anything lifeless in me. So a sin like you shall not covet or a sin like coveting and unbelieving Paul, they both seemed to be in a less perilous condition when the law wasn't as near as it could be. And then the reverse was certainly true. When the law or the commandment came near, when it came home, when it came and it drove its point home, both sin and unbelieving Paul were in a more perilous condition. Verse 9, the last half, but... When the commandment came, the sin power became alive, and I died. But when the commandment came, do not covet, in the sense that it made its point clear to unbelieving Paul, then the sin power became alive, and Paul says, when it lived, I died. The sin power seemed to take on a life of its own, and Paul died. So sin seemed dead while Paul seemed alive, but all of that changed when the commandment came. When it came home, then the sin power was alive in him, and he was a dead man. A dead man. As good as dead. As good as dead before God. I think that is something of what Paul is expressing here. I can remember uh, having all kinds of fun living it up in uh, all kinds of nefarious activities as a young man, only to get caught and then remember saying, I am so dead. I am so dead. Paul realized he was dead. He's recounting his unbelieving life when the commandment came home to him, you shall not covet. Paul must have been shocked. What? And the power of sin through that commandment produced coveting of every kind in Paul. And so any carefree, any ignorance is bliss living that Paul had been in, it all came crashing down on him and he realized he was dead. And these believing Jews that he has a pastoral burden for, they need this vivid reminder from Paul's unbelieving life as they watch um, him interacting with both the law and the sin power within him. And again, as, as good as law is, as righteous as the law is, as holy as Mosaic law is, if this is what happens in the unbeliever who turns to the law as a power for self-righteousness, then the unbelieving Jew's only hope is to be freed from that law, like he needed to be freed from sin in Romans 6. Romans 6. 
The point of Romans 7 is for believing Jews to see that they indeed have been freed from the law like they were freed from the reign of sin. And that takes us to the fifth fact, number five. Sin deceived unbelieving Paul to death, though life was the aim of the law. Sin deceived unbelieving Paul to death, though life was the aim of the law. Here's another way to express what happened when unbelieving Paul and the sin power within him and the law all met each other. I mean, Paul's like this test tube and you put in the sin power and then you put something good in like the law and you put a top on it and you shake it up and it's devastating what happens in him. And verses 10 and 11 go together. And this commandment, which was to result in life. This ties the commandment back to the do not covet. But certainly this is true for any commandment. This commandment, which was to result in life, that just reflects again the original virtue and nature and design that God built into his commandments. His commandments are all about life and not death. From his design point of view, that's what he has in mind, had in mind. They point to life, they, ultimate, they point to ultimate life with God, the lawgiver. What else could they result in? What else could they point to? Well, what happened with that good commandment in unbelieving Paul? It proved, verse 10, to result or point to death in me. Instead, it pointed to death. Whatever God's original intent and design was aiming for, life, with that commandment, just the opposite happened for unbelieving Paul. Well, how? Well, verse 11 explains it for us. For the sin power, dot, 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 deceived me and killed me. This is what sin does. This is its nature. When Jesus died on the cross, that characteristic about sin did not change. This is why we talked about in Romans 6 that our death to sin means that we changed. We are new people in the presence of the same old sin. Sin didn't change, but we changed toward sin. So, how did this happen? Remember, the sin power took up a military operation against unbelieving Paul through the commandment. Verse 11, the sin, taking an opportunity, there it is again, took up a, a military base of operation through the commandment. When the sin power commandeered the commandment, it deceived unbelieving Paul. Well, how did it deceive unbelieving Paul? Well, remember, verse 11 explains verse 10. So, the sin power deceived unbelieving Paul that despite the fact that you see coveting like coming out everywhere in your life, Paul, the sin power deceived unbelieving Paul that the good intent of the law for him could still result in life if he just gave it a chance. So I know you got sin coming out everywhere. Just turn to the law. It's, it, it's to result in life. And so Paul turns his back, walks towards it, and sin pulls out a dagger and stabs him in the back and kills him. The law did not kill Paul. Sin did. That was the deception. His so sinful, unbelieving Paul is deceived to turn toward the law for life, and instead what sin does is sin kills him. Paul's hopes of what he might accomplish with the law in his life were all dashed to the ground. Unbelieving Paul realized he was as good as dead before God. And so again, the believing Jews in the church in Rome, they needed this vivid, heartbreaking reminder from Paul's unbelieving life. The power of sin within him the sin power deceived him, killed him, all through the commandment that was designed by God only for life. 
And this law is, verse 12, holy. The commandment is holy, and it is righteous, and it is good. And because sin killed me does not mean that the law is death to me, verse 13. Did that which is good become a cause of death for me? Did it, did it actually become death? No. May it never be. It's preposterous. Don't even think such a thing about the law, Paul says. But if this is what happens when the good law of God and the sin power both mix together in an unbeliever's life, the only hope for that unbeliever is to be freed from, released from the law, just like the believer was and must be freed from the reign of sin in Romans 6. Do you understand? And that leads to the last fact, number six. Unbelieving Paul saw the exceedingly sinfulness of sin through the law. So we're back to defending the virtue of the law. This is the last part of verse 13. So then... What is death for me? Well, it's not the law. Rather, it was the sin power that was death to me. The sin power was death to me. Paul is repeatedly here trying to separate the good law away from the the sin power. All that was sinful, all that was deadly in unbelieving Paul could never be attributed directly to the law But all that was awful in him came through the law because of what sin did with it. So so then why is all this happening? Well, here's the good news. God has not fallen off his throne. He, He didn't have, sin didn't come up to God and God had his law in his hand and sin didn't slap his hand and knock the law out of God's hand. God is still achieving results. What is he doing here? This was in order that it might be shown to be sin. So the sin power, when it killed me, it was in order that it might be shown to be of a sinful quality. And how was that achieved? Verse 13, by effecting my death through that which is good. What is he talking about? The commandment. So the sin power needed to be seen more clearly for what it really was, sin. But then even more is intended, verse 13, so that through the commandment, the sin power would become utterly sinful. So there's a progression going on here. Do you see this? Through the law, unbelieving Paul came to know the sin power. But that sin power hijacked the good commandment and then coveting just burst forth into outrageous, enormous excesses within him. And that does more than just make sin known as a power. It shows the sin power to be atrocious, utterly, exceedingly sinful, The sin power within unbelieving Paul was utterly evil to do what it did in Paul through something good, the law. What was to result in life, what was holy, what was righteous, what was good, all got ensnared into something really nefarious. And so instead of life, death. Instead of holiness, sin. Instead of righteousness, unrighteousness. Instead of good, evil. All in unbelieving Paul. And the believing Jews that Paul was concerned for, they must not be allowed to think poorly of the law, but they also must not depend on the power of the law. So two things have to happen at the same time for these Jews as he's trying to care for them. Don't think poorly of the law and don't turn to the power of the law. 
just a terrifying glimpse back into Paul's unbelieving life will adequately prove why these believing Jews had to be released from the law just like they had to be released from the reign of sin, but the law in no way is like sin in its character. Do you understand what Paul is doing in Romans 7? Verses 7 to the end is like an autopsy, as I said earlier, on a spiritually dead man. Within unbelieving Paul, there was a disease that was rampantly multiplying and it killed Paul. And this autopsy reveals the cause of his spiritual death before God as an unbeliever. So I just want to ask you this morning, are, are you still an unbeliever? Are, are you still an unbeliever? If you are, let Paul take you into the facts of his own spiritual autopsy so you can see what the cause of spiritual deadness to God is in you too. It's the power of sin. Sin is like a, a powerful entity, a power in you. And, and let Paul show you the fact that he tried to use something good. He turned to something other than Jesus Christ, and he tried to do something good. He tried to use something good to rectify his internal problem and his vertical problem with God. He turned to God's good law, God's commandments. He hoped life would result. But sin hijacked the good rules in him and deceived him and killed him through those rules. Listen, you don't have to go and, and live this out and discover it yourself another day. You don't have to live another day in that spiritual deadness. And your answer is not found in turning more to a set of rules or trying harder, and that's not your answer. Your answer is found only in Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can deliver you. In fact, Paul is going to cry out in verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Multiplied sin within you can only be taken care of one way, not with law, but only through the death of Jesus Christ at the cross in your place. Your multiplied, atrocious, exceedingly sinful sin that's within you must be put on him entirely at the cross such that his holy father would actually crush his son in your place under his wrath. That alone satisfies God's righteous wrath against you and your sin. And it is the only way for God to remove your sin from his sight. And the call to you today in the gospel is to believe Jesus Christ and to not try any works of law. Don't believe and try to do good works. Apart from good works, believe Jesus Christ only. Believe God that that's his method don't say, I think I have another way. I'm going to try with these rules. No, believe God that what he said he does to save sinners by faith alone in Jesus alone is right and true. You can see through Paul's living death what happens when an unbeliever tries to bring good rules near to get life. Turn away from that and instead believe Jesus Christ to be your deliverer and do it today. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for delivering sinners through him and through him alone. Lord, we exalt him. We exalt his name. Um, We want to boast in him, and we want to put all of our confidence in him and have no confidence in the flesh, have no confidence in even something good that you give like a law. Oh, Lord, may we have our eyes opened to see that he uniquely stands alone where deliverance is. He is the source. He is deliverance from sin, from your wrath. Oh, and Father, would you please also help us to see how exceedingly sinful our own sin is. Lord, let us not be mindful and most concerned about how exceedingly sinful other people's sins are, our cultures, our countries. But may we be humbled, ashamed, shocked in a manner as we see our own sin such that we would want to flee again to your son and take refuge there under his loving arms that were stretched out for us. How good you are. How kind you are to sinners. Lord, be merciful to even one today who needs your mercy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.